to episode 77 of My Life Radio. I'm your host, Matt Blackburn. Today we have back Georgie Dinkoff, the incredible researcher. This guy's like an encyclopedia, just the amazing amount of knowledge that he can store in his brain blows me away. And to me, that is a sign of health that someone can connect the dots like this and sift through all the studies and sift through the propaganda to actually find the truth. And that's what Georgie has done. So always, always fun to talk with him. And in this episode, we mostly focus on a Q&A where he gives extensive answers to questions such as what do you recommend for someone dealing with HPV? Is there such thing as estrogen kickback when taking progesterone? Uh, Effective ways to lower estrogen. We talk about the safety of methylene blue. Is carbonated water bad for you? Can people crave it? Uh, We talk about electrolytes. We talk about dry mouth, thrush. We talk about high fructose corn syrup and various other topics. Also, we focus heavily on the liver health and what the liver needs, especially to detoxify estrogen, which I've talked about in the context of my CLF protocol with how estrogen works with omega-3s and iron to form that age pigment or liver spot called lipofuscin. So it's a combination of estrogen, iron, and omega-3 PUFAs, DHA, EPA, and ALA, that contribute to lipofuscin, which is that oxygen sink that prevents oxygen from getting to the tissues. So you'll love the show. Here is Georgie Dinkov. All right, we're here with Georgie Dinkoff. Welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me again. Yeah, it's always fun. People uh, rave about our last one on uh, cannabis, alcohol, and tobacco. <laughs> we, I wasn't even planning on talking about that, and just the conversation went that direction, the hormonal effects of those three substances. Yeah. And uh, that was one of my most listened to episodes. People loved it. That's, so. that's awesome, especially now with, with the stress of the shutdown and everything else. I'm sure people are reaching <laughs> more into that private stash <laughs> and being, being sensible to try to protect themselves by, you know, doing things that limit the risk, which is great. You know, uh, I'm not, there's no judgment here. You know, when, the, when there's stress, you do what you can to relieve it. Because uh, clearly your doctor is, our doctors are not good at that, at relieving the stress. <laughs> so we have to take matters into our own hands. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think like food first or, or metabolism first, and then see how that works on your stress. And right. um I wanted to kick this off. I, you post so many awesome articles on heydude.me. Mm-hmm. And the one that caught my eye recently was food emulsifiers yeah. and endotoxin causes brain bleeding. That's wild. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I didn't, I mean, I didn't even, so, I don't even know so that's, why they uh, threw in the, the emulsifiers there. Uh, I mean, for the endotoxin, I think to most of your listeners, it, it wouldn't be a surprise that endotoxin causes vascular damage. This, this is actually kind of fairly well known in the medical industry even, but they claim that for most people, endotoxin is not a problem because the liver will actually will actually deactivate it and then it will not allow it to be causing this long-term damage. However, uh, what, what the doctor fails to mention or probably doesn't even know is that two-thirds of Americans have liver problems, two-thirds. So we, we immediately have the disclaimer of, oh, your liver is going to take care of it. So this immediately flies out the door, flies out the window. Um, also, like a third of third of Americans are pre-diabetic, which means they already have a vascular complication. So probably even a lower amount of endotoxin will be enough to, to wreak havoc, right? So all of these disclaimers that medicine says, oh, don't worry about endotoxin. Yes, it's a bad, it is bad stuff, but uh, for all intents and purposes, you shouldn't worry about it because uh, most people will be able to handle it without any without any problems. Um, that's not what we're seeing. I mean, uh, if anything, the health of the you know world is declining. It's not improving. So then we should be worrying about even things that they tell us not to worry about. And uh, those food emulsifiers actually add to the to, to the danger. And if you look at the study, they had some graphs in there. The food emulsifiers were actually, in some cases, even more effective than endotoxin 
uh, the, it causing that uh, those like uh, malformations, cavernous malformations um, that basically re lead to brain bleeding. Um, and they didn't say that it, that it leads to hemorrhaging strokes, but having that cavernous malformation, one of the long-term effects of that is having a hemorrhaging stroke. But also, in general, if you look at the rates of hemorrhaging strokes, they've been rising in the population. And medicine has been saying, medical doctors have been saying, we don't know why. Well, here is one reason. Probably, the, I mean, in the absence of other evidence, I'm going to take what I have in front of me, which is the massive increase, the pervasiveness of these emulsifiers in every type of food. Organic food, you go and pick up an organic uh, label out there. I actually check my local Whole Foods. Only two brands of milk out of at least 40 did not have some kind of a gum, um, like carrageenan, uh, silicon dioxide, titanium dioxide. Actually, titanium is not allowed in, in organic products, but like many of the gums, uh, modified cornstarch, pectin, all of these things that are used as emulsifiers, they're all there. And this, this study said every single one of them contributes just as much as endotoxin does to brain bleeding. And by the way, keep in mind, endotoxin, there are ways to control it more or less, right? You can take charcoal, can kill the bacteria in, your, in, your, in the microbiome. I don't know what you can do with the emulsifiers. I mean, I'm not aware of anything except potentially charcoal that can actually prevent them from doing their damage. So you're exposed, if you're eating any kind of a commercially available food, you are exposed to these emulsifiers on a daily basis, and there's potentially less you can do about it than, than, than the endotoxin, which... You know, which is which is uh, what we used to think is the real danger, and now it looks like it's the actual food supply that is the real danger. That's wild. I wonder if fulvic acid, like in shilajit, can help because that that chelation complex is a lot of things and Mo neutralizes metals. a lot of things. Yeah, mostly metals. They're mm -hmm. very good as metal chelators. Um, actually, so fulvic acid and shilajit are great, but they're hard to find in good quality. Um, I love them mm -hmm. personally. Any other, so amino acids are also good chelators. So eating sufficient protein mm -hmm. can actually have a chelating effect. Um, uh, succinic acid, malic acid, and even citric acid are also good chelators. But citric acid, you probably don't want to overdo on that because it's capable of, uh, uh, you know, activating dormant tumors. And in people, with, uh, in animals with already existing tumors, giving them citric acid has been shown to speed up the... Uh, the, the, the growth of the tumor, probably because citric acid feeds very effectively into the fatty acid synthesis cycle, and that is already known to be upregulated in cancer, and conversely inhibiting the fatty acid synthase pathway is now known to be therapeutic in cancer. So citric acid is, is probably not a good idea unless you're consuming it with something like, uh, you know, as part of orange juice or, you know, or, or pear juice or any other, uh, any other fruit juice that has a number of different anti-estrogens and anti-estrogens uh, and flavonoids that have an anti-cancer effect to kind of offset the effects of citric acid. Uh, but, you know, malic acid, so, uh, so pear juice, apple juice will be great. Um, you know, it's, it's a pretty good chelator. And so citric acid is, is actually great, um, but, um, you know, uh, in order for you to get sufficient amounts, I think... Uh, the only recourse is, is doing supplementation. So you, you have to buy it as like, as like a pure powder. I think Amazon sells it. I mean, it should, shouldn't be too difficult to find. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yesterday I was having a conversation with the owner of a health food store. And we were just talking about all the people that over the last 30 years have come into his store and fruitarians and breatharians, all these people, and just talking about the root cause of issues. And I was trying to give him like a snapshot of what I believe from what I have experienced and you know, iron overload, lipofuscin, right. PUFAs, carbohydrate. And it's so hard in like even a five minute conversation to give someone the picture. It's almost like I have to point them to my podcast. Yeah. But the reason why I bring that up is those statistics you gave are wild. Like two thirds of Americans have liver damage, yeah. one third are pre diabetic. And I mean, E deficiency, K2 deficiency, yeah. PUFA diet and supplements iron overload from the fortified foods so, and the hard so water. There's so many things. Quote unqualified is two thirds of Americans have liver problems. And then that, that includes all liver disease, including cirrhosis, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, also known as NASH, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and also alcoholic fatty liver disease, and also hepatitis, the various hepatitis uh, infections. They're also, they're also known to cause liver damage in the long term, but even in the short term, having hepatitis impairs liver function. So if you combine all of them together, two thirds of Americans have a liver problem, either acute or chronic. Um, but, you know, just, just on the, and if you look at the scarier part is that the younger generations are actually the ones that are hit the hardest. 
Now, the older generation, like the boomers, they, if they ever have a problem, it's usually hepatitis, uh, some kind of a hepatitis infection. It's not a coincidence that well, now that you see the commercials on TV about that uh, hepatitis drug, Truvita, or forgot what its name was, that can cure it. All the actors in the ads are invariably over 60 or like, like even like over 70 because the boomers are the biggest population. I mean, they have the highest rates of hepatitis C infection. But in terms of NAFLD, NASH, NASH, or even cirrhosis, it's actually the millennials and even Generation Z. So these young people that are coming up and they should be healthier, they're actually the ones with the, with the worst liver problems um, for a variety of reasons. I mean, bad food is one example, but uh, the rates of alcohol abuse, especially among the millennials, are staggering. Um, you know, that they consume more alcohol than even the World War II generation, the one that the fought the World War II generation, and those people were heavy drinkers. But unlike the, the, the millennials, those people ate primarily saturated fats, and those are known to protect the liver from the damages of alcohol. Well, the, you know, the, the millennials are all about peanut oil, grapeseed oil, uh, you know, uh, rapeseed oil, all kinds of oils, all kinds of seed oils. Um, and combined with alcohol, that's, that's probably one of, the, one of the, the second worst thing you can do for your liver, short of exposing it to like an X-ray or some other kind of ionizing radiation. The, so the second worst thing is eating copious amounts of PUFA and combining that with alcohol. Interesting. Yeah. And I, I've had Morley Robbins on the show a bunch and he talks about how yeah, a lot of mothers, um, since they're restricting animal foods and maybe on a vegan diet or keto or whatever, they're vitamin A retinol deficient and copper deficient. Yeah. And those, yeah. those two deficiencies can translate to an unhealthy child. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So, the start. Stunted growth, you know, uh, underdeveloped brain, um, underdeveloped gonads, all of these things, underdeveloped thyroid, all of these things are, you know, they, they tend to be fairly unnoticeable during childhood because metabolism is still relatively high. You're, you're not loaded up on PUFA yet. Some some children start to be, but most of them are still not, right? Uh, so they so while the, the energy is good, metabolism is fine, you know, you, you, you don't tend to notice it. But now we're having an epidemic of early teenage uh, children getting getting basically prescribed a co copious amounts of antidepressants because they're having mental health problems at an unseen rate before. Um, and this, this tells you that something happens. So uh, usually health peaks at about the age of 12. If you look at the actuarial tables, you'll see that the mortality rate, all-cause mortality rate is lowest uh, for the age group between 10 and a half to about 12 and a half. Um, so anything before or after that is higher, but you know clearly then, you know, at, at, at older age, you start getting like dramatically higher, you know, mortality rate until it reaches 100 at, you know, I don't know, at the age of 125, which is like when the oldest person uh, recorded, uh, at least confirmed, was known to die at that age. But uh, yeah, so 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 while we're seeing, so while the children are young, many people are not paying attention to these problems, but severe nutrient deficiencies early in the childhood can imprint you for life. Um, for a number of different chronic problems later on, one of them, which is liver disease. You know, if, you, if your liver is not getting a sufficient amount of vitamin A and E, these are the two primary vitamins through which the liver combats estrogen. And vitamin B1 um, and B2 are needed by the liver to excrete estrogen. So, so vitamin deficiencies, as benign as the doctors think they are, are actually very heavily, um, capable of very heavily influencing systemic health and sometimes for life, especially if this happens early in age, you know, if all your child gets is like uh, some of these corn meals that are sold at grocery stores everywhere else, and you know, the doctor says, oh, it's all about the calories and the completeness of the meal. Let's look at here. Oh, yeah, it has all the 100% of the RDAs of all the vitamins. Everything's fine. Uh, keep in mind that the RDAs <laughs> were developed based on a prison population. So those values are what's basically the minimum uh, amount needed for you to not die, right? Uh, that doesn't mean that's the amount you need to be healthy. Um, and of course, you know, buying some kind of a cornmeal or any kind of a processed food from the from CVS from the grocery store, you know, every once in a while is okay if there's a craving. But if that's your main meal, which for a significant portion of the American population it is, uh, and, and I'm lumping into that McDonald's, you know, Burger King, Wendy's. Just look at, just go and look at the ingredients of of their meals. I mean, you have Polish sorbets. In virtually every meal, the fast food chain sell. This is a known carcinogen, which is banned in over 80 countries around the world. You cannot have it in the food system, period. 
Um, yeah, of course, there will always be some minute amounts, but but the levels are heavily monitored, right? And if the Polish surveys are exceeded, the which is the, whatever the limit, the state set limit is, there's there are usually serious consequences, or at least based on you know on paper, there's some some there's a potential for severe legal consequences for for the offending party. Not so in Western Europe and in the United States. Polish surveys are considered perfectly fine. You can ingest them, drink them, eat them. Uh, bathe in them if you want, and as far as the FDA or the medical industry is concerned, you're perfectly fine. If so, anything happens to you, it's your gene, man. It's your fault. Nobody else's. <laughs> yeah, we went to a burger joint like a month ago, and in the cooler they had uh, sodas and glass. Uh -huh. And I was like, oh, great, you know, cane sugar, it's clean. And I looked at, I think it was Fanta, Fanta drink, yeah. and I looked at the ingredients, and it had all the dyes, that, like red dye. Yeah. 60 or whatever and we're like oh dang because that people will blame the sugar yeah. right when it's really the poofa or it's the food colors or all the other things you know about the doctor uh, high fructose corn who, who basically he's a pediatrician i have to send you his book uh, ray mentioned him uh, a few times uh in his interviews he basically he specialized in AD, ad and and adhd um and he he claims that he wrote a couple of books that the vast majority of his patients were cured for good even if you assume that these disorders exist, right? They're just, you know, we, we now know they're just a symptom of an underlying energetic deficiency. But he said that the, he, he kind of cured about 80% of them by simply making sure that their mothers, their parents knew to eliminate all of those artificial dyes. And he provides a number of different references and studies which show that these artificial dyes, especially like the red 40, the yellow 50, uh, the blue 10, whatever. The FDA has a number of different classifications. Not all of them are bad. For example, vitamin B2 riboflavin is also known as yellow, some kind of other number, because it is used as a coloring as well. That one is fine, but the, but but it, it's not an artificial flavor. That actually will say natural, I'm sorry, it'll say natural colors, right? But the ones that say artificial, mm -hmm. the vast majority of them, if you look at the animal studies, the results are really not that good. Um, I mean, they, they have a, a number of different uh, uh, negative effects on the reproductive system, on the neurological system, um, on, on bone health, um, and in, in general, on longevity and the incidence of chronic diseases. But of course, you know, when you present these studies, um, you know, the FDA only uses them to set like the, the, you know, certain limits of how many, how much of these chemicals can be in a drink or a food. They're, they will not ban them. And if you bring this up to a doctor, the doctor will usually say it's perfectly fine. You know, it's uh, it's, it's just a coloring. You know, it's, it's not a problem. Well, guess what? Uh, what was that thing? There's like a, a toly, uh, toluene bromide dye, which is like this beautiful indigo slash greenish color, but it's very, very toxic if you ingest it. Well, you can certainly have very, and usually in nature, very bright colors are actually used as a warning mechanism. I mean, that's how, that's how we evolved. Um, and, and usually anything of a bright color should be treated with respect. Um, but that's, I guess that's not the rule at the FDA. Um, despite, despite the <laughs> mountains of evidence, I mean, uh, this, I'm not making this up. If you pick your favorite artificial color, let's say yellow, some, whatever the number is, not riboflavin, something else, or, or the red. Usually the red colors are, are, all, are all artificial. And type that in PubMed and then you'll see what kind of studies come up. Uh, yes, they're in rats, yes, they're in mice, yes, they're in rabbits, yes, they're in monkeys. But at some point, I'm thinking, okay, so we have evidence that the negative effects of this dye are, are basically are reproducible in at least four different animal models. So at what point the burden of evidence is on the person claiming uh, that this is bad for people? And at what point should be the burden of evidence should be on, on the manufacturer claiming that it's not harmful, right? I mean, if I have five animal models, Call me paranoid, but I'll say, you know what? Until other evidence is available, I'll assume this also translates to humans unless you show me why it wouldn't, right? Just just blindly stating, oh, this is, these are just animal models. It doesn't translate to humans. Well, why wouldn't it? We're not talking about genes. They're talking about metabolic effects. They're saying, you know, yes, uh, the FDA will not allow genotoxic, mutagenic things in the food supply. So the only remaining things that we, the, the only remaining effects that we, we can apply to these dyes are epigenetic, metabolic, right? So these things are conserved and largely the same across multiple species, including humans. So if, if, this, if this is bad for rats, mice, rabbits, guinea pigs, monkeys uh, is, uh, uh, of all, then uh, until other evidence is available, I'll say, you know what? I, I will not have any part in that. Uh, and I think it's, it will be wise for most people to exercise such caution 
because we, tr we truly don't know until these things have been in you know such in 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 a uh, in an extended use for a long period of time among the general population. That's basically like the it's like the clinical trial that the pharmaceutical companies do. It's just done on the general population. And by now the evidence is available in humans. But if you look at the studies that are published, they're all epidemiological. Um, basically, nobody will sponsor a clinical trial that's large enough to have a statistically convincing power so that the FDA says, oh, you know what, it's, it, it will be akin to doing a clinical trial for a new drug. Who will do that considering that they will reap no benefit financial from it, right? You're not going to be able to sell anything if, if the trial is successful. All you'll be able to do is show that a specific dye is toxic. And guess what? Even if you convince the FDA to ban it, they will ban that specific dye only. If you want to if you want to ban all of them, they may be structurally similar, but FDA will say I need a clinical trial for every single one of them. So that route is is is, is a dead end. I don't think uh, this anything can be done legally about that except avoiding foods that that list these things on the label. I mean that's the simplest and perhaps the safest things we can all do. Awesome. Do you, do you want to jump into the Q&A, yeah. Georgie? Sure. All right. Um, this is a good one. What do you recommend for someone dealing with HPV? Uh, the human papilloma virus. So uh, as, there's a blog post on halo.me, which I made just a few months ago, and it showed that the HPV by itself is actually benign. It's not the HPV mm. that causes the cervical cancer. It is actually estrogen, which we probably mm. all suspected for a long time, but we didn't have direct ammo until the study came out. So there's a blog post there, take, take a look at it, and it showed that the HPV is actually responsible for also skin cancer, but it's not the HPV, it's HPV. So in other words, active infection with HPV is a simply a symptom of estrogenic overload. So taking care of the estrogen may very well both lower the viral load and also prevent these, um, you know, the, both the cervical cancer and the skin cancer, which is really the, the end goal is to prevent these terrible diseases from occurring. But as it turns out, it's, it's just another bogey, uh, bogeyman that, you know, the, the medical industry found and said, oh, we like the HPV because guess what? We can invent a vaccine. Uh, don't touch estrogen. Estrogen is not a cash cow. We don't want to be talking about estrogen at all. But the study is pretty, is pretty um, straightforward. Um, so things like, so I would say progesterone, both like uh, both vaginally, if it's a female that we're talking about, or orally, if it's a male, because it's usually uh, it, it, HPV can cause, or they thought it's the HPV, can cause throat cancer in males, right? Uh, Michael Douglas, the famous actor, uh, recently gave an interview saying that, I don't know how many people know, but he has throat cancer. And he, <laughs> he gave an interview recently saying that he got it by performing a lot of oral sex on his wife. Um, and it was the HPV that was responsible, is what he claimed. The doctor told him, you have HPV in your throat, and that's what caused the oral cancer. But, you know, now we know it's the estrogen. So oral progesterone for males, if they have HPV, some kind of a worry about HPV causing some nefariousness in the, in the respiratory tract, but it's really estrogen that's doing that, right? Um, and vaginal progesterone for women, um, because it should take care of both the estrogen excess, and I forgot to mention, uh, progesterone has no potent direct antiviral effects. So do most of the other pregnant steroids like pregnenolone and any of the hydroxyprogesterones um, and also some of the androstane steroids such as DHEA um, and potentially even testosterone also have antiviral effects. But the, uh, the, the, the ones for progesterone and DHEA are, are the most well known. There, there's, 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 the most, there's the biggest amount of evidence for those two steroids. So either progesterone on its own or progesterone with a little bit of DHEA um, should be able to, uh, to take care of it. Um, but if, if there is a concern of estrogenic excess, then it may not be a good idea to add the DHEA because it can contribute to raising estrogen even more. So maybe best to stick with uh, progesterone and aspirin, which is another great anti-estrogenic chemical, vitamin E, vitamin K. Actually, all the four fat-soluble vitamins have no direct anti-estrogenic effects with vitamin E and A perhaps being the most directly anti-estrogenic. Vitamin E can uh, inhibit estrogen effects both at the receptor level and also by inhibiting the enzyme aromatase. And vitamin A is a known estrogen receptor antagonist. Uh, in fact, there are some countries uh, where they actually sell vitamin A and E as a topical ointment to treat gynecomastia, which in, in men is known to be caused by excessive estrogen. So there's your evidence for a direct anti-estrogenic effect in humans. Wow, that, that's a perfect segue. Someone asked, is there such a thing as estrogen kickback 
when taking progesterone. Oh, uh, uh, kickback by me like a rebound like, or, or like the estrogen will rise somehow? Uh, I, th I think, yeah, the estrogen rises from taking So progesterone, progesterone is, in addition to being an estrogen receptor antagonist, it is also an aromatase inhibitor. So it should not lead to uh, estrogen kickback. What you may see initially is that because most of the estrogen is stuck inside of the cell when there's an estrogenic overload, what you may see initially is when you're taking high doses of progesterone, the blood levels of estrogen may rise for the first few days. But after that, as if you're continuing to take the progesterone, you should actually see a decline in estrogen levels. Um, and, you know, this is also due to two different reasons. One, the, the inhibition of the aromatase enzyme by progesterone and also by progesterone inhibiting excessive pituitary function, which also leads to increased estrogen, est estrogen synthesis. So, so, over, so initially, high dose progesterone, maybe for the first two, three, four, maybe up to a week, you may see increase in blood levels of estradiol. But after that, there should be there should be a decline. Okay, awesome. Um, and I think this is the last uh, progesterone question. How to properly dose progest E for females? Oh wow! I mean, that's a, such a such a wild card question. It really depends on so many things. What is the cause? What's the reason? Right? What is the hormonal balance of the woman that's trying to take it? Um, if it's for contraception, I think Pete recommended like basically rubbing about 100 milligrams onto the cervix. Uh, about an hour before intercourse, and it can be done, you know, continuously every single time it's needed. Um, if it's for combating estrogenic excess, I don't think there's an upper limit. It really, I mean, if a person, if a female has breast cancer, they're uh, one of the older drugs still approved for the treatment of estrogen receptor positive breast cancer is a synthetic, is a, actually a progesterone derived, uh, proge, pro, pro, progestin derived from progesterone is known as medroxyprogesterone acetate. And uh, daily dosages of that uh, progestin are between 600 and 800 milligrams daily for a person with breast cancer. So I would, I wouldn't, I don't think it's a bad idea to use a similar dosage of bioidentical progesterone if the person has breast cancer. If you're looking to simply restore physiological levels of progesterone, then then uh, basically between 30 and 50 milligrams daily on a daily basis is 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 enough, um, and often even 30 milligrams will suffice. Both men and women produce about 20 to 30 milligrams daily of progesterone before puberty. So that is the physiological dose before puberty. After puberty hits, the women get into the, 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 cycle, the menstrual cycle, and then they have like a surge and a, and a tank of progesterone. But in general, 30 to 50 milligrams daily is okay um, uh, and should be fairly safe for a woman to do on a daily basis uh, to keep estrogen at bay. Any, any source of, uh, any type of a symptom of estrogenic excess, I would increase the dosage of progesterone to 100 milligrams daily for a few days until you get, until you have a decline of those symptoms. One of the most reliable symptoms is trouble sleeping, insomnia, agitation, uh, easy excitability. All of these things are signs of, of excessive estrogen. And usually if, if you take enough progesterone to oppose the, uh, uh, to oppose the estrogen, the excessive estrogen, you start, you get a feel of calmness, potentially even sedation. If you take, if you get sedated, you've taken a bit too much. Nothing wrong with it. Just you know, just don't drive for like for a few hours or operate machinery, whatever it is that they tell you on like uh, the official warnings. Uh, when you take sedating drugs, they say don't drive or operate heavy machinery. So same thing here. But you know, in general, if you hit the sweet spot for progesterone, you'll feel a sense of calm without being sedated. That's usually a, a good indication that that estrogen is under control. Um, and um, so yeah, that, that will be the, the three use cases that I foresee. Um, and then if there is anything on the skin um, that's due to estrogen, such as any of the skin cancers, at this point we have evidence that all three major types, the basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, and melanoma are all due to estrogen and driven by estrogen. So if there's a situation like that, then I would rub progesterone around the problematic spot, spot not directly on top of it. I will rub between 50 to 75 milligrams of progesterone on a spot that's basically a few inches away from the problematic area, and that usually has uh, basically a, a calming effect on the uh, on the entire limb or whatever the area is that that that, that the problem on the skin has occurred has occurred. Um, and uh, Pete has mentioned a, a couple of uh, uh, a number of different anecdotes. One of them from his brother, um, and even his own experience that he apparently got active melanomas to regress by using a, a combination of progesterone and DHEA in a three to one ratio. And he said he applied about 
75 milligrams of progesterone and about 20 milligrams of DHA once daily, about two inches away from the from the melanomas. And he said within a week they returned their color returned to normal. Uh, they were no longer this wow. pitch, you know, pitch black um, and it, of, of irregular shape. They normalized and started looking like like moles, like a regular circular brownish moles. Uh, if it starts getting intensely black and and with irregular shape, that's usually a sign that it's that it's progressing into a melanoma. That's amazing. And with like age spots, I was talking to a friend on the phone yesterday and I was telling him like alcohol topically and vitamin and E, vitamin e and, and even aspirin, yeah, right? Yep, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So all these things, is actually alcohol orally, um, all those studies, I, I don't know if I've sent you that study, but basically they showed that uh, with rats again, but they showed that the equivalent of a drink to a drink and a half daily, up to two, but no more than two, uh, uh, given to the rats orally, they had a much lower amount of lipofuscin in their liver, brain, thymus, um, spleen, and uh, and the reproductive tract. Um, rats don't tend to get much lipofuscin on the skin, so it's hard to you know claim a direct effect translation of humans there too. But humans do get lipofuscin inside of their organs, and if the study on rats is is indicative of anything, is that lower intake, lower amounts of alcohol daily, which by the way happens to correlate with the epidemiological studies, which show that people who live the longest and have the lowest rate of alcohol mortality are the ones who are light drinkers, not heavy drinkers and not teetotalers. But by the way, the heavy drinkers um, uh, who 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 ate good diets still had lower mortality rates than the teetotalers. So there's something about alcohol that in smaller amounts, and it, uh, it, we still don't know if it's exactly the alcohol. I think the Lipofuskin study shows that it's probably the alcohol is one factor, there, but there are other factors as well. You tend to drink with other people. It's, you know, social environment. Uh, you, you enjoy their company. All of these things have, uh, have positive effects on health. But we now have at least one study showing that oral alcohol at, you know, reasonable in reasonable amounts, one to two drinks daily, uh, may help with reducing the Lipofuskin inside of the body. That's cool. Yeah, we have some honey mead here, and I want to make some. Some like this guy Stephen Heron Buter wrote a book, you know, like ancient herbal recipes for for beer or something. And you could use different herbal concoctions. And I think there's a healthier way to do it, and yeah. without endotoxin, right? It's a whole different ball game. And also, beer is uh, the the hops is so is so extremely estrogenic. It's really that's that's like contributing to 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 mm-hmm. to the negative effects of beer. Beer, however, has a number of different positive effects. High amount of B vitamins, uh, like the brewer's yeast that's that's typically used for beer, is also highly nutritious. I'm sure you know the story. Uh, Repeats dad cured his diabetes type one, by the way, which is con- considered to be incurable by eating nothing but brewer's yeast for two weeks, um, and then he never had symptoms. He never used insulin throughout his life, um, and that's unheard of for a diabetic. But uh, basically, the brewer's yeast. So if you can do beer without the hops. I think would be a great achievement. I mean, be, with all the other ingredients except the hops. Um, and even if you're doing the hops, um, you can actually negate m- most of the effects, the negative effects of beer by adding a little bit of apigenin or naringenin. These are flavonoids that have, that actually act like they're known as phytoprogestogens. They're actually the the natural equivalents of progesterone found in the, it's found in nature. I mean, progesterone is also found in nature, but you're mostly associated with animals, right? So you have to extract it and have it as a purified steroid. But if you don't have that, you can actually buy some apigenin powder or naringenin in powder and mix the, mix that into the beer. They're not very highly soluble, but there is enough alcohol in the beer to dissolve sufficient amount of them to negate the effects of hops. So you can have a healthier beer this way. Or just take a spoon, a little bit of naringin and apigenin before drinking beer, and you should be okay. That's pretty cool. I use like a fructose and vitamin C too, like whole food vitamin C. Sure. If I'm gonna have a glass of sure. wine or something, that, that seems true. to help. And niacinamide too, because the most of the negative effects mm. of alcohol, aside from so, if you're a light drinker, alcohol will get metabolized before it gets a chance to do much damage. But if you're a heavy drinker, then then alcohol's peripheral effects, uh, indirect effects, such as increasing the permeability of the gastrointestinal tract. And that's really what allows the endotoxin to get into the bloodstream and go to the liver and harm the liver. Uh, now, if you're a light drinker, uh, the alcohol will get metabolized and absorbed and broken down before it has a chance to do that. But for heavy drinkers, um, basically, you need to do something that protects the gastrointestinal tract. And that saturated fat is great for that. That's one of the reasons for the older studies that they cured cirrhosis in alcoholics in India. While the alcoholics continued abusing alcohol as much as they did before by feeding them butter or coconut oil. 
So, so that's what protects the gastrointestinal tract. Uh, but in terms of the alcohol's direct effects, it's a reductant, so it drops the NAD to the NADH ratio. So take a little bit of niacinamide about 30 minutes before drinking and or some methylene blue or any kind of a quinone such as vitamin K, emodine, um, methylene blue is a type of quinone, it's an electrolyte withdrawing agent, anything else that, that basically shifts the redox balance towards oxidation will help prevent this reductive state that alcohol cr uh, creates and it, it contributes to its pathological effects over the long term. Wow, that's cool. And since you, since you brought up methylene blue, I heard recently um, from someone in the peak community, and, and we all have our different perspectives, but he was saying that methylene blue in large amounts is toxic, so be careful. I haven't heard of that. Have you? I mean, I'm sure like, you know, a gram or two grams, but uh, you'd have to take a lot, a lot well, of drops. I will send you a study. We actually, uh, I don't know if I mentioned it to you before, but I work with a uh, group of scientists in Bulgaria, uh, where I'm originally from. Um, and we published a few studies with our product Oxidal. So it's not only methylene blue, it's got a little bit of caffeine and salicylic acid, but for all intents and purposes, you can take the results for Oxidal and apply them to methylene blue. And they did a study on carcinogenity, mutagenicity, antioxidant effect, and, they, and basically, so you'll have to ingest a lot of, uh, they used a solution of 5% methylene blue and, and tested it on yeast. So to, to achieve 5% methylene blue, in your bloodstream, you would have to ingest grams of methylene blue. And that's the only, by the way, that's the only concentration that, that was harmful. They also tested 3%, yeah. 2%, 1%, and a half percent. And even 3% is a massive amount, but it had no negative effects. The danger of methylene blue is mostly associated with its potential to inhibit the enzyme monoamine oxidase type A. And that's the enzyme that degrades serotonin. So if you take methylene blue by itself, even in high amounts, it will probably be okay. But it, uh, there are published case studies showing that methylene blue in combination with serotonergic drugs, such as the SSRI drugs, or anything else that also inhibits monoamine, uh, uh, mon monoamine oxidase type A, can lead to a serotonin syndrome. Um, but the good news, um, multiple human studies at this point, one of them from like, uh, I think it was April of 2020, showed that the optimal uh, effects of methylene blue, the, the benefit of methylene blue seems to plateau we in humans uh, at about 60 milligrams daily. And that, by the way, matches, corroborates that study that found that was an Alzheimer's study. And that, that corroborates older studies done with methylene blue for bipolar depression, psychosis, and a number of different mental health disorders, which found uh, uh, basically a curative effects on 15 milligrams daily. So between 15 and 60 milligrams a day seems to be the most that humans could or probably should use to reap all the benefits and at that dosage, I'm not aware of any published evidence that methylene blue can, can cause harm. Now, if you are taking an SSRI, then I'll still be careful. Uh, but if you're taking an SSRI, I think you have bigger problems to worry. You know, maybe maybe it's uh, the first thing on your list should be how to get off of the SSRI and, and, and then consider things like methylene blue or something else to substitute for it. That's interesting. That's really cool. Um, this is a good question. Is carbonated water bad for you? Can people crave it? Would it be due to a deficiency? I am not aware of, of, uh, of any, uh, of, I don't know, of any mechanism through which carbonated would be bad for you. Keep in mind that in Germany, that's, that's, that they consume primarily carbonated water. I think that's the country with the highest consumption of carbonated water in the world. Um, and uh, they seem to be enjoying perfectly good health. In fact, probably the best in Europe on average. Um, and also... Also keep in mind that in ancient Rome, carbonated water was basically a, the, the exclusive drink of the patricians, of the, of the, of the upper class, of the, of the nobility. So they did not like drinking the regular water. There are other reasons for it, mostly because the regular tap water was contaminated with different pathogens. But, so they made their own water and carbonated it. Um, but carbonated water was almost the only water that, that uh, the nobility in ancient Rome drank, and they, they had no issues with that. Um, I, the only cravings that I could think that it could increase is that because uh, carbon dioxide tends to deplete intracellular calcium, yeah, you may want to increase your calcium intake. Uh, but other than that, only good things could slash should come out of increasing the amount of carbon dioxide in the body, which is what car carbonated water does. I personally only drink carbonated water unless I'm outside and there's nothing else available, then I'll drink uh, mineral water or tap water. But, uh, and I like the brand Gerolsteiner. The reason I like it is because 
you have a massive amount of magnesium bicarbonate, which we have discussed before multiple times. It's a liquid form of magnesium that's very well absorbed, and you can make it yourself at home, right? And basically, it raises your both levels of your carbon dioxide and magnesium in the body. Well, if you don't want to be spending the time, but are willing to spend the money, look for, for the Gerolsteiner water online, look at the label, and actually it gives you a breakdown of all the minerals and how much bicar it's a massive amount of bicarbonates per, per liter. It's basically, it's almost like you're drinking baking soda dissolved in water, except it's instead of sodium, it's magnesium bicarbonate, which is, um, I, would, I would tend to think it's slightly more beneficial because most people tend to be deficient in magnesium before they become deficient in sodium. Mm -hmm. Yeah, our whole house filter here injects magnesium bicarbonate in and the other bicarbonates at the end. And I think it's funny to see like in the keto community, like potassium bicarbonate is trending so much. Like the anti-sugar community, they're all about potassium, but magnesium yeah. is like more important to me and it's most more deficient. And you should be careful with the potassium. I mean, it can, you can cause heart arrhythmias uh, if you overdo it. Keep in mind, to this day, the, the official execution drugs in the United States are basically uh, uh, effectively an injection that that uh, that creates a state of overload of potassium, and that's what stops the heart from beating. So so don't, don't be careful with the potassium. There's a I don't know if you know, but the the supplements, the potassium supplements in the United States, the one that is sold in in bottles, in capsules, they're limited by law of containing no more than 99 milligrams of potassium per serving, um, and that's the reason because FDA is scared that somebody will use it as a suicide weapon or a homicide weapon and dump it somewhere and basically dissolve it and have somebody drink it and have them die from cardiac arrest. So, uh, so yeah, you don't want to be overdoing the potassium. I mean, drinking your orange juice and eating your potatoes and, uh, you know, uh, other, other uh, uh, tubes and root vegetables, uh, it'll probably give you all the potassium you need. You don't want to be overdoing it as supplement. Magnesium, that's fine. The worst that can happen with overdoing magnesium is give you loose tools. But other than that, I don't think you can overdo the magnesium. I wonder if Bill Gates is putting potassium in his vaccines. <laughs> I, I, at this point, nothing is out of the question, you know. The world is so crazy that, that if somebody came over and said Bill Gates, you know, I'm sure you've heard of this of, of, the, of these theories of the of the lizard people, right? They said like the uh, George Bush is, yeah. a, is a, a reptilian, right? And uh, I was looking at some surveys that, that basically track what percentage of people believe in those. And if you look, the percentage of people believing in this have been, has been steadily increasing. Used to be like three to four percent of the general population in the United States. I think at this point it's 17, 17 percent. So wow. The, this is to me is indication not so much of the truthfulness of that theory as in that people are starting to be willing to believe virtually anything simply because they've been lied to so much um, and because most of the things they hear officially on TV turn out to be untrue. So the the knee jerk reaction is, you know what? If you guys have been telling me all these things officially and they're not true, well, let me try the other ones because, you know, what, what possible harm could it cause? You know, I've tried all of everything you've done. Yeah. It doesn't work. So let's see. Let's see what happens if I try the crazy theories. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think like the sh I've looked into shape shifting because I was into like cryptozoology and all the like Loch Ness monster for years. And but shape shifting is interesting. But I think like demonic possession is more uh more more practical uh, <laughs> what's happening <laughs> <laughs> yeah if you are next to a line for uh, for let's say like a few years chances are you 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 will be cert you will be a certifiable psychopath uh, you will probably meet the diagnostic criteria for at least as much as i don't like psychiatry and i think it's a fake science uh, some of the, some of the symptoms that they describe in their the, their bible called the dsm the, the diagnostic and statistical manual of mental disease diagnosis uh, basically, they, the the symptoms that, disc that describe a psychopathic behavior are spot on. So it's it's uh, if you look at all the mass shooters in the United States over the last 20 years, every single one of them was on at least one psychotropic drug. Could be an SSRI, could be a benzo, could be an antipsychotic, which by the way are known to actually cause psychosis in some people. But all of this is immediately swept under the rug, saying like you're not a doctor. Who the hell are you to? To you know, criticize and, and raise questions. You know, um, even though they, you know, the warning there's a black box warning on many antipsychotic drugs saying that in some people this thing will actually cause the psychosis or exacerbate it if it's already there. And I'm thinking, but under what circumstances do you think it's a good idea 
to 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 sell this to a person. I mean, I, I understand if a person is in the hospital under observation, potentially even being strapped to like a gurney or something, right? Then all bets are off, and you know this person cannot do much damage except potentially to themselves. But even that can be controlled. Sure, then maybe you can give him a drug like that in controlled environment. But be allowing this to be sold on the street. I mean, there with especially now with people's compromised health and becoming worse by the by by the day. You're just asking for trouble. I mean, I'm actually surprised we haven't seen more mass shootings. Um, and and there probably are. We just don't hear about it because in order to make it to the news, you'll need for somebody to kill five people. I mean, I, I know it sounds bad, but that's what it is. There is a certain threshold that the media, in order for the media to get excited. If you shoot up like a, you're, you know, walk into your former employer's office and shoot up three people, including your boss, you may, you might make it to the local newspaper, might. But you know, if it's a regular occurrence, probably not, and definitely not. You're definitely not going to be making the national news unless the issue is very political, in which case they'll pick it up. But anyways, so yeah, it's basically, uh, yeah, like you said, the demonic possession slash uh, medically induced psychopathy, which is what I like to call it, iatrogenic psychopathy. I think that that is a good explanation for many of the ills at the state level that we're seeing right now: evil politicians, evil agencies, evil laws being passed. People voting for evil laws, all of this. So, like, so in a position of power, serotonin causes you to try to want to dominate others. But when you're in a do, in a in a subordinate position, serotonin actually causes you to want to continue to be subordinate. It's really it's really a very a very nefarious uh, uh, neurotransmitter if it's if it's elevated. Yeah. So it's like if you pick the, any any person in a position of power who is acting in an autocratic manner, their serotonin is high. Pick any person from a population where they're seem content with their fate, resign to their fate, and no one it's a it's a form of learned helplessness. So it's it's abuse and tyranny at the top caused by serotonin, and it's learned helplessness at the bottom also caused by serotonin. Wow. There, there's a good website, um ewg.org tapwater database, and it shows like trihalomethanes, and you put in your zip code, it'll show all the stuff that's in the water, chloramine, whatever. But they can't really measure pharmaceutical drugs. And, and a lot of these people are probably on subclinical doses of tons of pharmaceuticals just drinking the tap water as their primary source of water. I mean, here and there is probably not a big deal, but like it's their primary source. They're getting other pharmaceuticals, too, to combine with those benzos or S's. So it's a crazy cocktail, right? The people are probably seen, the seen, brains uh, of all sorts of stuff. Have you seen the post that I made uh, was like in September of last year? About basically, they looked at the uh, at the at the effects of subclinic of a, a minute doses of, of psychotropic drugs found in in seawater. So it was close to it was actually already in the sea because it was dumped there by the sewers and it was supposed to be already filtered. So most of it was already filtered. So we're talking of even smaller doses that will end up in the tap water because in the ocean it gets even more diluted, right? It's a massive amount of water. The crab, the, the population of crabs that was living within three mile, uh, uh, not radius, but within three mile distance uh, of the of the shore, basically started exhibiting cannibalistic, homicidal, violent behavior, um, and they were exposed to, to amounts that, are, that are amounted to about one, one hundredth to one thousandth of the amount that you would get by taking this drug as a pill. And it was about one twentieth of the amount of what's found in tap water. So we are, if you're drinking tap water, we are straight on being medicated against our will 24-7. By, by, by ingesting these drugs. Wow, that's pretty crazy. <laughs> um, this is a good one. Does the body interchange electrolytes during times of need slash abundance? Yes. They can actually fill in for each other to a large degree um, until you get to a point where basically if you get a very severe potassium deficiency, um, you will not be able to properly utilize glucose. And at that point, all hill, all hill will start breaking loose you start. I mean, you may experience hypoglycemia symptoms or hyperglycemia, depending on the person. Um, you start getting dizzy, d disoriented, could potentially faint. Um, in really heavy, in really uh, severe situation, can even go into a coma. Um, magnesium deficiency, all the regular symptoms such as cramps, but uh, more importantly and more often overlooked is inability to sleep properly and on a, in an uninterrupted fashion for say seven to eight hours. Waking up during the night, say two or three times, is a very good sign that 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 your that your magnesium levels are low. Um, and potassium, I'm sorry, potassium, sodium, and calcium can fill in for magnesium to a little to a degree, 
but none of them really have the same calming effects um, on the nervous system that magnesium does. Calcium does at lower levels, but if you overdo the calcium, and if you're not producing enough carbon dioxide to take the calcium out of the cell, then you get into this calcium overload slash excited toxicity. So you can get into a situation where, you know, if you only, you know, if, you, if you're not getting enough magnesium or you're losing too much magnesium and you're only replacing with calcium, it could be a problem. So uh, there needs to be, uh, you, need, you need to take care of all of the electrolytes, uh, but the ones that you tend to lose the most um, are sodium and magnesium, especially if you sweat a lot, if you exercise, um, if you're drinking alcohol or anything else that makes you leach even, uh, uh, like excrete even more electrolytes in your urine, if you're taking any kind of diuretic drugs, anything like that. Potassium tends to be spared because it's usually inside the cell. It should be inside the cell. It's an intracellular nutrient. So is magnesium, but its retention depends on the ability to produce ATP because magnesium in the body is typically bound to an ATP. It's in a, in a magnesium ATP complex. So if you don't have enough ATP, that freely floating magnesium will end up in the bloodstream and it will get excreted. Um, and then sodium, um, you can actually, so you lose sodium pretty easily. It's mostly an extracellular nutrient, so it's supposed to be more easily lost. Uh, but we tend to, uh, for most people, uh, you know, unless you're consciously restricting salt, for most people, uh, sodium loss is not that big of a problem. It does become a problem in severe hypothyroidism when, with the exception of potassium, you're actually deficient on all of the three other electrolytes, and that can cause a lot of bizarre symptoms. The doctors are scratching their heads and saying, like, what the hell is going on? This person both has cramps, but it's also, like, overly excited, and then basically they're having these mental confusion symptoms. So it's basically a combined symptomatology of a calcium, defi calcium magnesium, and, and sodium deficiency. Uh, for potassium, it's very hard to get deficient on it, uh, you tend to absorb it really well from food, and the cell preferentially holds on to it as per the Gilbert Link Association induction hypothesis. The proteins inside the cell bind potassium and, and hold it inside of the cell. So, um, yeah, eat your potassium, but I don't think that what the keto community is doing there by ingesting an extra of it and a lot of it, I don't think that's wise. But in a, in, a, in, a, in a temporary deficiency situation, the body does and can use some, some of the other available electrolytes to fill in for whatever is missing. Um, so your, your goal in terms of replenishment should be mostly focused on the magnesium and sodium because those tend to be lost um, very easily uh, on a daily, even hourly basis, especially if you're sweating and you know, you're out in the heat out there, right? Uh, and then calcium, you need it. You need a certain amount on a daily basis, but you can probably you can eat all of your calcium in one sitting, and you'll be fine. Uh, while the sodium and magnesium, I think they need to be taken with every meal, simply because we tend to lose them so easily. Interesting. That makes me think like milk's the perfect food because it has the sugar to raise carbon dioxide, yeah. and so you can't overdo the calcium because the carbon dioxide exactly. Is pushing it out and right? also the calcium if it's properly utilized it has a stimulating effect on the enzyme pyruvate dehydrogenase which is the limiting factor for for the metabolism of glucose you take anything that stimulates pyruvate dehydrogenase pdh is an abbreviation um you, it will have a good effect and it may normalize an electrolyte imbalance if you have if you have too much calcium in your cell increasing pdh will increase carbon dioxide right it will get that extra calcium out of the cell and if you have a deficiency um, then basically like it will allow you to more to to more judiciously use whatever calcium is available in the cell same thing with magnesium you speed up pdh you'll be producing more atp you'll be retaining more magne more magnesium same thing with sodium i mean if you speed up uh, uh, basically the more serotonin you produce the more sodium is needed because the protein that degrades serotonin, the, this, uh, uh, the serotonin transporter, which is what these SSRI drugs inhibit, so that protein is, depends on sodium. So if you, are, if you are in a serotonin overload, which most of us temporarily or chronically are, whether due to drugs or getting forcefully medicated through the water and whatnot, um, that sodium is used very quickly to deactivate serotonin. So you need to be resupplying that uh, the sodium on a, on a continuous basis. But more importantly, if metabolism is good, you can actually oxidatively destroy serotonin. So the, the serotonin transporter will not be in, in much use and it spares your sodium usage as well. Oh, that's awesome. Um, this is a good one. Is it possible to live healthy without supplementing hormones, just supplementing vitamins, minerals, 
et cetera? Um, it is. But ultimately, the, the question is, if your metabolism is high, you will be able to tr to to trans to um, convert cholesterol into most of the nutrients that you need, into most of the steroids that you need. The problem is the following. With advancing age, we tend to accumulate fat. And, and fat fatty cells have a very high expression of the enzyme aromatase. So even if you're converting the cholesterol properly downstream, you will tend to overproduce estrogen. So, so it, it, so it, you know, even if, if, even if your metabolic system is working fine and you're synthesizing a good amount of downstream steroids from cholesterol, right? Um, anything that goes down the androgen pathway will have a decent chance of converting into estrogen. So, so uh, yes, it is possible to to have good health without supplementing hormones, provided you're taking measures to keep the tendency to overproduce estrogen with advancing age under control. So by that, I mean, uh, maybe aspirin, maybe vitamin E, none of these are hormones, right? Um, and then mm -hmm. if you take those and your metabolism is working well, you should be able to get by without without taking steroids as, as a supplement. Awesome. Um, how to recover from dry mouth or thrush and chapped lips after a round of erythromycin? Um, so I've found that uh, taking a little bit of coconut oil together with charcoal uh, works wonders for thrush. Um, and as far as the dry mouth, um, I'm not sure if this if this is due to the erythromycin. I mean, uh, usually dry mouth is a symptom of excessive anticholinergic activity. Um, so you know, uh, taking eating a few eggs that, that contain a decent amount of choline should be able to to uh, uh, you know recover um, the the moist the moisture the, the moistiness of the mouth. Uh, but it, you know, if it's due to something else like electrolyte imbalance, usually drinking a little bit of orange juice. Uh, in my experience, it works wonders for dry mouth. My children tend to overheat and get dry mouth when they run in the heat and play in the heat. Um, and I found that orange juice works the best in terms of oral rehydration therapy, also known as ORT, uh, better than any other drink. But not many people know, both Pepsi and, Co and Coca-Cola are on the World Health Organization's lists of officially approved oral rehydration therapies. So if you don't have orange juice, you can give your children, or you can take you can take a sip or two of yourself of a Pepsi or Coke, as long as it's sweetened with sugar, you know. But even the even the high fructose corn syrup is probably not that bad, provided it's it is the fructose syrup and there is no leftover starch. So uh, so yeah, I will try the coconut oil and the uh, and the and the um, and the charcoal. Another thing that seems to work well if you use it as a mouthwash is methylene blue. So putting uh, five drops. Which will be a, let's say like uh, making a uh, making a solution water solution of uh, methylene blue and putting about 10 milligrams per quart of water and then using that as mouthwash seems to work really well. Uh, methylene blue is officially used as an antifungal decontaminant for aquariums, and that's that's basically that's how people treat their aquarium as well, because fung fungus tends to overgrow whenever there is this excess of water. So uh, instead of emptying the aquariums and scraping them, you know, every two weeks or so, people will put some methylene blue inside and it helps the fish if they have a fungal infection. And it also kills any fungi, bacteria, or virus that's in the aquarium. Um, and they're using lower dosages, by the way. They're using five milligrams per gallon of water. But uh, if you want to handle trash, the reports that I'm getting from people is that, is that 10 milligrams per quart of water seems to work rather well. Use it as a mouthwash. You can you can swallow it afterwards if you want, or you can spit it out. It doesn't matter. Uh, but doing a you know a mouthwash for about thirty seconds, um, as you will do with Listerine, seems to work really well. That's really cool. And I want to expand on the the high fructose corn syrup because you said as long as there's no leftover starch. What do you mean? Because I thought I I can't remember where I heard it. If it was Ray or um, Danny, they said like thirty like high fructose corn syrup is usually like what is it thirty seven percent starch. Is, does it depend on the source? Because I thought it was all bad, all of it. <laughs> so if it's the actual syrup with, where, the, where the starch has been fully transformed into glucose and fructose, then it's actually pretty good and it's actually mm. indistinguishable metabolically from the sucrose. The problem is uh, there's a study which um, we've circulated. It was years ago, but it's still available out there. It tested, uh, it, it, it bought a number of commercial drinks, commercially available drinks, and, and tested the calories that are in those drinks. And he found an excessive amount of calories that was not reported on the label, and it was in the form of starch. 
So basically, it turns out that the whatever company is producing the high fructose corn syrup is probably massive agricultural conglomerate is cutting down on cost by not fully processing it. So when you're drinking a can of Coke and it says it has 40 grams of high fructose corn syrup, that study found an additional 40 to 60 grams of starch on top of that high fructose corn syrup. So it's not that the high fructose corn syrup contains starch, it's that it's that it, it comes in a not fully produ not fully purified, not I don't want to call it purified. It's not fully, it's not gone down fully the, the production cycle. So basically you have leftover starch and it seems to be a significant amount in some commercial drinks. So, so you, it's not so much about the calories, but if you're ingesting liquid starch, it, that's clearly having a, a you know a, a, a detrimental effect because it increases endotoxin, right? And also people think, oh, I'm taking only 40 grams of sugar, while in reality you're taking 40 grams of sugar and 60 grams of starch, which shifts the ratio of fructose to glucose, and now you have a lot more glucose plus starch, which tends to have a an, uh, um, you know a very strong effect on the insulin response. Uh, typically, if you're eating sucrose, which has about an equal amount of glucose and fructose, you shouldn't have much of an insulin response. So if you are having these drinks and if you're measuring your blood glucose and you're getting a large spike of insulin or blood glucose afterwards, chances are you've gotten one of those drinks that has a very high amount of leftover starch in it. Got it. Uh, wow, that's that's fascinating. Um, someone asked, what do you eat? For some reason, people ask me for meal plans and what I eat in a day. People love that stuff, but... Um, uh, what do you eat, George? I, mean, I, I, I try not to be orthorexic because um, I think it's important to avoid PUFA any chance you get. Um, I think it's important to get a decent amount of dairy um, or other, other good source of calcium. Um, and I also think it's important to not overdo the meats. Other than that, I think everything is fair game. I'll also avoid legumes because the legumes are highly estrogenic. But other than that, so starches, mm -hmm. I eat limited amounts, but if, if, the, if I have well-cooked potatoes or well-cooked white rice, I'll eat it, you know? I mean, uh, if there's nothing else available and, and I'm hungry, it's more important to avoid the stress response and by exa and to, to avoid exacerbating by worrying about like, oh, is this scoop of white rice going to kill me? Well, it's better to eat now and, and raise your metabolism and then think about it and then maybe make sure you, know, you don't get into a situation where the only option you have available is rice. But in general, I'm not orthorexic with with these made with these uh, high level rules as little puffa as possible um as little starch as possible no legumes right um and actually legumes are easy to avoid because you know where they are it's pretty it's pretty easy to avoid eating uh you know peas or like or you know or, or soy or beans or whatnot it's more difficult to avoid the puffa even though it's more detrimental simply because it's everywhere right so for that, I, I do I constantly try to avoid it, and I take some vitamin E to balance whatever remaining puffa I have ingested. But as far as the rest of my eating habits, um, they're pretty high level and generic. You know, don't overdo the meat because of the phosphates and the uh, inflammatory amino acids such as tryptophan, methionine, and cysteine. But I still eat meat. You know, maybe once or twice a week, uh, on average about twice a week. Um, I love seafood. I like shrimp. I like oysters. Um, I mean, I like the regular the, the regular fish that I can get. Um, yeah, I think you can get some pretty good um, tuna that's very low, almost no fat um, in the actual tuna. Um, so yeah, I mean, my diet is pretty pretty normal and actually closer to what bodybuilders normally eat, with the exception of that they really overdo it on the carbs when they're in the bulking phase because they want to grow. So they eat a ton of rice and potatoes. On that, I'm not so keen. But uh, yeah, lean diet uh, and no more than 15% of fat if possible. That's awesome. Do you think it, um, like eating meat every day is okay if you're consuming like a quart to a half gallon of milk a day? <laughs> um, I would say it's, it's okay if you're, cons if you're consuming um, about, you know, uh, if you're consuming a spoon of gelatin with every, with every meal of meat, then you're fine. Uh, because the, the gelatin will largely neutralize the negative effects of the uh, inflammatory amino acids and also will largely neutralize the, the, the elevation in phosphates. Uh, gelatin stimulates the excretion of phosphate. Niacinamide does the same. So if you're taking any of these, if you're eating gelatin or taking glycine as a supplement, taurine does the same thing, or taking niacinamide as a supplement, then you're probably okay with eating meat every day. I just try to try to not to do it every meal. You know, I've had weeks where I've eaten meat every day because that was the best food that was available compared to the other options. 
Um, look, we don't have a perfect uh, food supply unless you're making that food yourself. Unless you have a farm, which you know you're working towards and trying to produce your own food, we're not going to get a perfect food supply. We just uh, just the system is is designed to to overload us with with bad stuff from everywhere. So choose wisely, choose intelligently. Don't overstress yourself over it. There are mitigating mechanisms that you can uh, implement, like aspirin, vitamin E, gelatin, whatnot. And it's it's you know eat whatever is available with the you know and choose the least harmful option. If that's the if that's the only choice, if those are the choices that you have, if you you know refusing to eat unless you're being asked to drink uh, a glass of pufa, in which case I would say no, I would prefer the stress response of not eating and getting the high cortisol. I would say no to that. Anything else, there's probably a sensible choice that can be made given the options that are available to you at any given point in time. I love it. Well, that's that's a good place to edit. I know you have to run. And uh, don't be orthorexic. That's a good message because with all this information, yeah. inf information overload, people can get paralysis. And I think that's where that question came from. Like, what do I eat? You know, what do you eat? It's like people have no idea, but just uh, keep yeah, it, it, keep it not, simple. Yeah, yeah, another reason not to get orthorexic is that once you start getting into the, you know, really these like niche ways of eliminating certain foods completely, mm -hmm. you tend to get and fall into predatory industries that are sitting there and waiting for somebody who is who is so keen on avoiding certain things that are willing to pay a lot of money for something that's unproven and they will claim, oh, that's that's going to completely eliminate your absorption of tryptophan. There is no such thing known to men. You can, you can, you can uh, reduce it, but completely eliminate it, I don't know. There are proteins out there you can buy, artificial proteins that are completely devoid of tryptophan. We don't know if these are good enough as long-term substitute of food, right? So, so yes, there are options if you, if you really want to be orthorexic. But so far, I've seen better results by not being orthorexic and making less optimal food choices than being orthorexic and doing everything by the by the book. Um, those people tend to become um, tend to tend to activate the serotonergic system, and you tend to negate any benefits you you got from avoiding like like the plague that specific uh, food ingredient. I love it. Well, um, thanks so much, Georgie, for your time. Stick stick around. I'm I'm sure we'll do this again soon. Uh, people love hearing from you and uh, stick around as I close out the show. Thanks so much. Right, thank you. Appreciate it. Well, that was a jam packed episode. A lot of info there for you to digest. I like how Georgie makes everything digestible and the way that he explains things, it makes it a lot easier to understand these complex uh, biochemistry processes. I found it interesting when he said that niacinamide, methylene blue, and vitamin K2, these quinone substances, can shift the redox towards oxidation away from reduction. That's a really easy way to, to think about it, that we really want to move cellular processes towards the oxidation side doesn't mean that reduction is bad all the time. just means that we want to be more in an oxidative state. And that was also interesting about the safety of methylene blue. I think a lot of people are afraid to take it once they learn that it's used in fish tanks, as Georgie said, um, to uh, prevent fungal infections. But 16 milligrams daily seems to be the sweet spot. On my website, I have the blue canatine from Transcriptions, which is a fun way to take it. It's just a little lozenge that you uh, keep on the side of your mouth and your cheek. And Georgie actually has a supplement line you can find at idealabsdc.com. I'll put the link below. And he has a product called Oxidol, which is methylene blue, caffeine, and benzoic acid. I'll put the link below if you want to check out his shop. I really like his progesterone. Um, he even has liquid vitamin E and K. If for some reason you need to give it to uh, children that can't take the capsules, I think that's a great route to go. And I endorse his brand. I think everything he provides is great quality and he has the research to back it up. He's very knowledgeable about all of his products. His blog can be found at heydute.me. That's H A I. D U T dot me. And he puts up a lot of blog posts, uh, one of which I'll be quoting at the end of the show. Just really, really mind blowing stuff. And he shares the research that's not being 
uh, highlighted, even in the alternative health community. There were some Q&A questions that we didn't have time for, so I'd just like to quickly uh, run through them now and uh, give my thoughts. Uh, one of them was, what can I do to improve my health after having thalasmia minor? B12, folic acid. So this condition is a blood disorder with decreased hemoglobin production. Uh, often it's diagnosed as anemia. And anytime you have anything related to iron hemoglobin, red blood cells. I really think about copper and beef liver, whole food vitamin C, and bee pollen. So they asked, what can I do to recover from that? I would say beef liver daily, every other day. That's what I would personally do if I was recovering from that. And really make sure that you're getting the bioavailable copper in there. I would also use shilajit. Personally, if I was recovering from that, because Shilajit has had an effect on quote-unquote anemia and conditions related to anemia, and that is a whole food supplement, pitch tar resin, that contains fulvic acid and 84 plus uh, known and unknown minerals bound to a negatively charged carbon, aka their usable organic minerals. So that can have a huge effect. The fulvic acid can help with mineral balance. I would really focus in that regard on shilajit and bioavailable copper. I would do a ton of whole food C. My current favorite vitamin C product is called Purely C from North American Urban Spice. Another question. Pregnenolone dosage for a woman in her mid-20s one year postpartum. <laughs> so that's similar to the question that I asked Georgie about uh, progesterone uh, dosage for females. And his response was it's very context driven. So I would say the same thing here with pregnenolone dosage. Um, if it were me and I was in that situation, I would just exercise caution and use a low amount and go from there. Um, definitely listen to as many uh, Ray P interviews and Georgie Dinkoff interviews as you can to get a better, better idea of these master hormones, pregnenolone, progesterone, and DHEA. I think people can overuse them and rely on them before doing the foundational work. So I would say make sure that you're supporting your metabolism, not skipping breakfast, uh, maybe even taking your body temperature and pulse to track your healing status for your metabolism uh, before going for uh, hormone therapy, even if it's low dosage. Another question, if high stress, divorce, and interrupted sleep for two years, new baby, how do I reset? So if it were me, I obviously can't make medical uh, recommendations. But if that were me, if I was in that situation, what I would do is maximize as many anti-stressors as you possibly can. And that is live in a way where you're supporting your system in every way possible to respond to the stimuli of, of stressors. So that would be things like whole food vitamin C for your adrenal glands, that would be things like magnesium bicarbonate, which is burned tremendously under any kind of stress, oxidative stress, psychological stress, arguments. So I would really do, if that was me, four, six, eight ounces a day, little shot glasses throughout the day of liquid magnesium bicarbonate. I would be taking maybe three to six purely C capsules a day, probably in that case, six three in the morning, three at night, or another whole food vitamin C product. There's a lot of great ones out there. Uh, Camu Camu, Acerola, uh, Amla, uh, supplements like that are great. Or just eating local seasonal fruit, if you have that available, uh, to get your vitamin C. Also using raw honey which is a great source of potassium and other minerals and sugar 
which is probably the number one anti-stress substance is carbohydrate slash sugar. And we could say sucrose, which is glucose and fructose. We can say fructose. We can say lactose. There's various different types of sugar, but I would consume them all. I would consume raw dairy every day because the calcium has an anti-stress effect, as does the sugar. Saturated fat can help to support the nervous system. Basically, animal foods. Be sure you're eating a lot of animal foods. You're not restricting carbs. Uh, fruits, roots, potatoes, squash are great. Rice, I would say wild rice, truly wild rice, like the one on my website. Or white rice, um, some ground grass-fed beef or steak. I find that animal protein, especially in the form of red meat, has a very strong anti-stress effect for me personally. That's something you have to experiment with, but that's pretty uh, well established in the literature that just amino acids have a lot of effects um, on the system. It's really supportive for the liver. Also choline and eggs for the liver. I think it's important to note that many nutrients are actually used up during the stress response. Uh, magnesium being the primary one, but just keeping on your supplementation of the right supplements, not multi-mineral supplements, not omega-3 supplements, not iron supplements, not ascorbic acid or zinc supplements, but getting on vitamin E, vitamin K2, especially K2-7, menaquinone 7, those are huge. MK7 is awesome for the mitochondria. And if you could get the mitochondria rocking and generating a lot of energy, then you will be more resilient to stress. I actually just received a message today of someone asking, can I megadose your purely K from MitoLife? I'm feeling like I'm Superman. Like I have so much energy. And yes, on the website, I have the benefits, the mitochondrial benefits of menaquinone 7. It's incredible what vitamin K in that form can do. It's amazing for energy production, for fixing problems with the mitochondria. It'll actually go in and fill in any gaps. Uh, it's a quinone, as Georgie uh, talked about. And so it can act uh, like coenzyme Q10. Some, people's, some people say even better than coenzyme Q10. And I would say is if you drink coffee, just avoid it on the days where you know that your nervous system is very fragile. Like if you have really, really, really bad sleep and then there's some, some days that you're better, then I would say those days that you're feeling more energized, that's the time to drink the coffee. And that's really counterintuitive to people because they use it primarily as a pick-me-up, right? When they're tired, that's the worst time to drink coffee because it doesn't support your metabolism that way. It just increases cortisol and the stress response. The reason for that is because when you're underslept, you cannot regulate your blood sugar as well. Your body doesn't have the ability to. But if you get a good night's sleep or a relatively good night's sleep and you eat a great breakfast within an hour, 30 minutes to an hour of waking with carbs and proteins together, then you can maybe wait a half hour and then drink your coffee or an hour even drink your coffee. And it'll have a totally different effect, especially when you add sugar to it. And I've had Adam Bergstrom on the show multiple times. He wrote uh, 10 books on yellow fat disease. Awesome guy. He also got me on the, what he calls the cobalamin tonic. I don't add cacao to it, but it's basically maple syrup in coffee. And that's a game changer. I think it's better than sugar. And I think it has more benefits with the B vitamins in there. But that's a super amazing cocktail. And if you take shilajit with it, maybe put some MCT oil, cordyceps or reishi if you want to. I have Alpha Dynamics little packets on my site. I think a lot of people will go to these, you know, medicinal mushroom supplements for an anti-stress. Like reishi is always advertised as that, reishi spore oil. If you want to add those on as extra, then go for it and experiment. But those aren't foundational. Right, Because the liver really needs vitamin E and vitamin K2. That's really foundational, these, these two fat-soluble vitamins. 
And as I talked about in previous shows, especially with Morley Robbins, A and D are not necessary to supplement. You can get that from the sun and from beef liver. Those are easy to get. No need to supplement A and D. They can actually cause issues if you do. So if you just focus on E and K, you will get a lot better benefits. And last thing on this, because probably my favorite question, just stress reduction questions. I love that is maximize your sleep. If you're getting interrupted sleep, then just make your bedroom the ultimate regeneration center. And that might take work depending on the context of where you live. If you're in an apartment complex, that's the worst. If you're in a house, that's better. If you're in an urban area with lots of space between the houses, that's even better. Due to dirty electricity and Wi-Fi signals, Wi-Fi. So there's ways to mitigate these things. I interviewed Dave Stetzer on an episode way back about dirty electricity and uh, his research into that with uh, uh, Graham. And you can get Stetzer filters. I have those on my website. They're just 30 bucks or so, and you plug them in the wall, and that will lower the dirty electricity. That's something you really want to measure because you can plug them in and just guess. I do whenever I'm traveling. I'll plug them into the hotel. I make sure to have them with me, at least three, four, or five. But that can radically improve your sleep because this is a, a frequency. These frequencies are coming through the wall, through the wiring, all throughout the room. And so you're just bathing in this dirty electricity all night. And it does affect neurotransmitters, as Dave uh, described in the podcast show that I did with him. So there's a lot of factors. Dirty electricity, turn off your Wi-Fi at night. You can get the Magnetico sleep pad, which uh, to me is a better way to go than a Faraday cage canopy over the bed, which if you have animals or it's just a hassle to have that thing. So Magnetico sleep pad, I sleep on 20 Gauss magnets. And I interviewed Dean Bonley about that, uh, which is a pretty uh, interesting uh, product and uh, it's natural it's not like man-made frequencies we're not putting frequencies through it's just amplifying the earth's magnetism so that's super anti-stress uh, i also like the chili pad we use the Uller pad at the lowest setting so it goes all the way down to 55 degrees fahrenheit and just cooling the bed with the Uller pad can help a lot i interviewed uh, tara on my website about that one or on my podcast and using a Winix plasma wave humidifier can help. Just raising the humidity in the room if it's dry. Using a hypoallergenic air filter, uh, we use the iAdapt Air. It's the small one in the bedroom and just turn it off at night. Just reducing the VOCs in the bedroom. Uh, there's, there's almost endless things you could do <laughs> to improve your sleep. But those are the big ones that come to mind. And then the bed itself, I use the CBH. Uh, furniture uh, they're out of Canada and if you contact them um, and, and mention me they'll actually give you a, a, a discount and that's that can be found at SwissDreamBeds.com uh, that bed's incredible uh, no metal at all in it uh, Swiss design very very natural bed High, I think it's the best bed in the world um, so that could be game changer as well. So there's a lot of ideas for you for sleep, which will lower your stress throughout the entire day. Next question, orange juice, honey, collagen, plus bee pollen. Yes or no? Um, yes. Sounds great. Anything to help with vitiligo? Uh, I'd say vitamin E is huge for the skin. Um, also, uh, copper, bioavailable copper, beef liver, um, Vitamin A is retinol. The usual suspects, those will really help uh, skin health. And red light therapy. I believe there's been studies on red light therapy with vitiligo. And as Adam Bergstrom says, the, the best red light therapy is the beginning of the day and the end of the day. So there's almost no ultraviolet light and there's a lot of red. So you can just do that if you want a free treatment. Or you can go to Gemba Red. Uh, there's a lot of great red light therapy products out there and try that out. It would 
be best combined with vitamin E therapy. Uh, causes and remedies for cellulite. Um, so that is a big concern for people. <laughs> uh, weight gain, love handles, excess weight, all of that stuff. I look at it as toxicity. Uh, a lot of it is toxicity combined with a sluggish metabolism. And so if you just increase the metabolism and uh, maybe get on the CLF protocol, handle calcification, lipofuscin, and fibrosis, then you'll see the body fat go down. Another really fun way to do it is just with sauna therapy, which I've been using for many years. Those little fold-up sauna tents. I don't think it's necessary to spend five or $6,000 on a wooden sauna unless you know, you're trying to feng shui your house and you want it to look a certain way. But the little black tent from relax saunas is really great and affordable and it really does the job so just sweating for 30 minutes to an hour a day can have a huge huge benefit for reducing cellulite best way to find an oral source of testosterone i would personally use something like pine pollen tincture crucial four has a great pine pollen tincture i have that on my website and that's a source of phytoandrogens. It's essentially bioidentical testosterone. You just don't want to over overdo it. And I would be on some type of an aromatase inhibitor. And there's a lot of them. If you listen to my previous interview with Georgie, uh, ones that you don't even imagine, like alcohol and tobacco aromatase inhibitors. But there is also nettle root. There's aspirin. Uh, there's a lot of aromatase inhibitors out there. So if you're on uh, even a plant kind of testosterone, then you want to be um, taking those. I'm also a big fan of uh, elk antler velvet. I have that on my website. I had uh, uh, David on my podcast once, uh, David Limaker, the owner of Vigor. And that's a supplement that I still take to this day. It's a great source of bioavailable copper. And a lot of really interesting compounds that I think are hard to get. Uh, the elk antler velvet. I would combine that with the uh, pine pollen. Also, shilajit. It's not well known that shilajit consumed for 90 days, 250 milligrams twice a day, significantly increased total testosterone, free testosterone, and DHEAS in a uh, 2016 uh, randomized control trial. Uh, by Pandit, if you want to look that up. I believe I have that on the, the product page. That's pretty cool. And I often take one gram a day. I think a lot of people underdose Shilajit, so 500 milligrams to a gram a day. And I think that substance is awesome. I think it's a whole food supplement, a source of known and unknown minerals and fulvic acid, which is uh, not really in our soil anymore because of acid rain the rain being 10 to 100 times more acidic and the last one thoughts on niacinamide for the skin so that's a form of b3 that is safer than niacin i think it's actually better than safe i think it's beneficial i'd say try it uh, my recommendations for vitiligo are my general skin recommendations i think uh, vitamin e is is the best for the skin uh, especially combined with red light therapy or uh, sunlight especially early and late sun but I'd say try it out and see if it improves your skin. So that's it. That's all of the Q&A. Uh, I'll probably start answering them on the show if I don't get through them because usually we run out of time with guests. And so I'll, I'll do this more on my show where I just answer the questions myself and hopefully it's helpful. If you want to check out my website, it's matt-blackburn.com. That's where you can find all of my recommended products on there. I have... The Poofer Protect, my vitamin E and MC2 oil. I have the Pristine Hydro uh, Travel Water Filter, can, which can be the primary water filter. Uh, that's 895 bucks with my discount code. And you just change the filters once a year. It's like less than $50. That's definitely the way to go. I would say avoid uh, mineral water and tap water. and It's a whole deep topic. I'll have more episodes on water for sure but i think 
hard water is really overlooked um, in pretty much every health community. Uh, besides maybe raw vegans, since they do just distilled water, but with distilled water, you still have the sulfuric and nitric acid in it, which are liquids and gases, and they pipe pass right through the post-carbon filter there. And you don't have bicarbonate salts in the water, which are naturally supposed to be in water. So the next product there, I have the electrolyte balance. I have the Blue Shield Portable, which I take with me all the time when I leave the house. And just a lot of cool, helpful products. So uh, definitely uh, cruise over there and check it out. I'm always adding to it. And my brand, you can find at mitolife.co. And that's my enzyme product, Shilajit, my new probiotic and endotoxin reducer, and vitamin E and K2. So thanks for listening. If you benefit from this show, Mito Life Radio, please share it with your friends and family. And leaving a review on iTunes helps me out. And thanks so much for listening. Let's get our mitochondria respirating again. Today's quote is by Georgie Dinkoff from his article, A third of Americans show signs of clinical anxiety and depression. The news about deteriorating health of the population just keeps piling on. The latest one below shows that at least a third of the U.S. population shows signs of clinical anxiety and or depression. The reason I put clinical in bold is that it means the pathology is severe enough to require treatment and, if left untreated, it can lead to a variety of terrible outcomes such as suicide, homicide, violent crime, domestic abuse, etc. Previous studies on the subject never used such strong qualifiers and usually belittled the findings by explaining that as long as the disease is not clinical, it does not really warrant much attention or action. Well, it looks like a third of the U.S. population is now clinically mentally ill. But this only tells part of the picture because it is an average across the entire country. In some states, half of the population is clinically mentally ill. And perhaps most of all, it is the youngest age groups that have the highest rates. So once again, the young have become the old. If that is not a reason for the FDA and other health authorities to sound the alarm on the absolutely abysmal state of health affairs, then I don't know what is.